you posted a tweet and it was a quote from master dogen a zen master yes saying you should stop the intellectual practice of pursuing words and learn the stepping back of quote turning the light around end quote and looking inward mind and body will naturally drop off and the original face will appear this is thinking of what does not think my specific question though you can comment on the whole passage if you'd like is what does mind and body will naturally drop off mean? Uh, let me say a little bit about about Dogen. He's a true uh, pinnacle of Japanese Zen and a superlative guy. He was neglected for centuries, but now he's uh, all the rage among academics. But in terms of Zen and as a Zen reformer, he was very, very... Uh, important and what he emphasized was the importance of authentic awakening because people can mistake altered states of consciousness or things like that for for true awakening and that's about as big a mistake as you could make but in addition to that what he stresses especially in his shopping shopping genzo is the importance of uh what's the phrase he uses he calls it the aftermath of awakening. And so there's a long history of people like uh, going way off the, off the, the track after, after awakening. And the phrase for that is, uh, you know, I, walking across the land and the, and, the, and the landscape's littered with skulls, right? Skulls of people who have awoken, but who have, who have uh, gone sideways. So uh, the, the Shobin Genzo is probably a good place to start, and Clary's translation is uh, superlative, as usual. Now, mind and body falling off is when you awaken, you're no longer particularly in your body, and you're, and you're not in your mind. Your mind and your body are just, just more pieces of the landscape they're not they're not particularly you uh, and yet they are you and this is the difficulty in articulating any of this stuff yes it's you that's walking around uh but your consciousness is so vastly expanded that the whole concept of of your mind your body is is ridiculous and so uh, that's just something that has to be experienced. But and so, and that would be, of course, the original face. That your your true self, your true identity, is as vast as the cosmos. And plus, it's suffused with the most indescribably deep, profound love that you don't even know what the word love means until you've experienced it. And furthermore, it's it's home finally your home you know finally you you found who you actually are all your problems are over at least temporarily and uh there's no place like home and so when you're home you're not particularly identified with your ego or with your thoughts or with your uh body uh as a matter of fact although the body is not that huge an obstacle your mind certainly is because if you start chattering if your mind starts chattering then it it uh it really is a damper on the whole experience and so uh so does that help it does help but i'd like to ask two follow-ups one is a clarification so mind and body naturally dropping off the description you gave is different from that point in meditation you can sometimes reach where you don't even feel your body or have thoughts anymore or is that also included in this idea no it's totally different than that right okay one is dissociation and the other one is transcendence and and uh, transcendence of transcendence it's 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 uh it's something altogether different and so that's that's a real danger in in 
uh, meditation that's not, you know, uh, how should I say, properly guided by a, by a teacher with experience. Because you can mistake, you know, the, the, the tranquilizing effects, the dissociative effects, the, the, you know, the, all the kind of things that happen during, you know, routine meditations for awakening itself. And that's a mistake. But when you've awoken, you don't need anybody to tell you that you've awoken. I mean, it's, it's, it's the beginning of your life and the death of your old life. And so, so, uh, yeah, that's probably all I should say about that. My next follow-up is uh, when somebody notices that they're attached to their body, they're feeling separate from the rest of experience. It's not like, as you described, their body's part of the landscape. Like, yes, it's their body, but also it's not... uh, not to be so possessive about it. They're feeling this attachment to it. What is the antidote to that to, to develop? Well, that's not something that, that that, that's what he means when he says your mind and your body naturally fall off. You Mm -hmm. don't, you don't try to do that. Trying to do that is a mistake. It's a deviation. And this is one of the problems that, that I see all over the place is that people mistake teachings that were, are meant for after, can show after satori and they 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 assume that if they just practice that beforehand they'll get to satori but that's not how it works it's not at all how it works uh so so the practices before and after are different and and it's 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 hard to draw a straight line i mean if you if you read through uh, there's a, a book called uh, transmission of light which is a compendium of, of zen awakening stories if you go through those or if you go through the all the hundreds of books that are written on this subject uh you'll find that there's so many different ways that people wake up but all of them include sincerity and almost virtually all of them i mean 99.9 percent of them include effort preparation and and intent true intent and and so without the sincerity and the intent and the effort, then you're you're not going to go anywhere unless you're you know uh, Ramana Maharshi or somebody. But you know those those are very different situations because he grew up in a culture that was was uh, imbued with that. And the same thing with Krishnamurti, right? Mm-hmm. And so if, if you look at the path of, for example, Eckhart Tolle, I mean, he was studying philosophy, German idealism, you know, Meister Eckhart uh, and, and people like that. And he was in a really deep depression. Now, that's the other thing is what you think may be good, may be actually working against you when it comes to awakening. In my case, it was after my ego was completely shattered and ground into the into the dirt it was shortly thereafter that I woke up after a nap. And so, so who knows how that part works? I don't think anybody, you, it's very hard to generalize as it should be, but the preparation is very important. And, and the thing that's good about the preparation is all it's going to do is improve your life. You know, every bit of your life. I mean, if you're more conscious, if you're more aware, just like, you know, the, uh, Spear is always talking about being in the, the uh, uh, being in, identifying with the uh, eternal eye or the immortal eye or whatever. Or, or, or Spear, uh, totally talks about the present. Uh, uh, Krishnamurti just calls it love, which is a great descriptor, by the way. And and those. I've lost my train of thought. I, I kind of got lost into the, into the something else there. So where were we? What were we talking about? Not deliberately trying to remove attachment. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can't, you can't, you can't, you don't know the means by which to get there, and that's why the preparation. But the preparation is always the same, pretty much. You know, intent, effort, and sincerity. And honesty with yourself. And so, so the reason that, that 
uh, that preparation for Satori is, is recommended for so many. One of the reasons is that there's nothing to lose. You know, it's all gain, no matter how you slice it. That's helpful. Thank you. My next question is about emotions. So Idris Shah suggests that people watch their emotional ebb and flow so that they can operate it and not it operate them. Uh, how do you suggest someone goes about watching or understand, coming to understand their emotional ebb and flow? By careful observation with a calm mind. Oh, and by the way, uh, getting excited about anything really doesn't help any of these processes, right? And there's a saying that, you know, the, 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 the spoils of war are lost in the celebration. And this is one of the other caveats they give to, you know, to people who, who awaken and think that that's, that's the end of it. Right, because you get all celebratory because you've you've arrived or whatever they say these days, and 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 you you you're, you're missing the the next the part of dealing with the aftermath, right, in a constructive way. As a, and and you can go very very destructive, and you see this all the time, and in, in you know fake teachers, fake gurus, all kinds of things like that. But but uh, in terms of uh, 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 Identifying the ebbs and flows of your emotion, that just means being conscious and realizing that your thought, thoughts are different. First, first you separate your, your, your observing faculty from your thoughts and you realize, hey, I'm not my thoughts. Those are just there, right? And where they come from and where they go is something for everyone to, to look at, right? And the same thing with emotions. Where do emotions come from? How often do they come? Is there a particular flavor that's over, you know, that's uh, predominant during a particular phase of your life, or something like that? And then you you watch them, and you and you say, well, wait a minute, does it come from my body, or does it come from my thoughts? And these these kinds of questions, the reason they're they're given as questions, is because teachers know that that if you're not observing for yourself, you're not learning anything. And so, so, you know, they talk about the materials, the books and, and, and things like that, that you need to read in order to get background, basic information, which saves you decades of time. And then, uh, the, the practices, and this is one of the practices is being conscious in the first you're, you're, like I said, you make that separation between your mind and yourself. And then once you've done that, then you can observe your emotions the same way you uh, observe your thoughts. And then. Uh, after you've done, done that, you can start to contemplate, well, wait a minute, where are these things coming from? And all of this is increasing your capacity to observe. And that sensitivity, that capability, that faculty is invaluable in life in general, right? And so rather than be the slave of whatever emotion hate happens to come up, anger, fear, you know, irritation, whatever, you start to become the master of it because you, you understand it. And it, it's just like, you're, you, you know, in the beginning, people, they, they, they start out and, and they, the reason they start on this path, many of them, is because they're suffering from their mind. And, and so once you've liberated yourself from your mind and you're no longer, you know, the slave of your mind, you know, which is, by the way, not just your mind, there's a collective unconscious and it's extremely powerful and it's very much operant and it needs to be noticed and it needs to be thought about, contemplated. <laughs> Once you're, you're free from that, then you can observe other more subtle things. And so it's a process of increasing your capacity to observe more and more subtle things, uh, which is very, very useful. I mean, period, full stop. When you say master of your emotions, is that just not letting an emotion pop up and affect you? Is that not feeling? Some people would be no, concerned. No, because if, if, if you stopped it, it wouldn't be an emotion. 
and also that's very unhealthy. I mean, who, I mean, the, the basic psychoanalysis, you know, you, you, if you repress emotion, it's just going to come up somewhere else. Yeah, you're going to act it out or you're going to displace it on the, to somebody or something else. And so, no, you don't, none of this is repression. None of this is like forced. Uh, this is the difference between power and force in, in Hawkins uh, language, uh, Dr. Stephen Hawkins. Is that his first name, Stephen? Richard, I think it's uh, Richard. Richard Hawkins. And so, so, so you don't use force ever in any of this work. And so, no, you do not want, by all means, you do not want to uh, repress emotions. And you don't want to repress thoughts in the usual sense of, of repression. Because all that's going to do, in, in, again, in psychoanalytic terms, is just going to build up pressure. And that pressure is not good for anything. It's just, it's just like uh, waste energy that's building up, but it's not discharged. So you don't want to do that. I mean, there may be exceptions, and everything has to be individualized. But in general, I think what I'm saying is is accurate for 99 percent of people. I'm curious about a specific emotion then, uh, humor. If, if, if I guess I don't know if humor is conventionally called an emotion or not. Um, is it? I uh, I don't know, but well, that's part of my question. From a neuroscientist or psych perspective, uh, what do we understand as being humor? What is humor? Well, that's a great topic. One that I've recommended to many people to study for a graduate thesis or something like that. There's some things that we do know it needs to be studied more scientifically. But so, but the question, so the question is a very good one. Uh, there are elements of humor that 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 have to do with the release of of tension that's built up in the process of telling the joke, and that's pretty obvious. But but let me use humor as an example. We use the word humor and the word emotion as both examples of why in the Tao Te Ching it says names can be given but not permanent labels, which is another way of saying words are never the thing, right? So even the word emotion is, is too limited and the word humor is all equally too limited. And so, so you have to, and this is the other capacity that has to be developed, you have to be, be able to see beyond the words, and I think that's what uh, Do, Dojo was was pointing to when he was saying see beyond the... Does he say words or thoughts? I don't, I don't remember. What did he, he say? Is, you should stop the intellectual practice of pursuing words. Yeah, so stop. So, so this is a good example. So instead of the intellectual practice of like studying humor, okay, well, what do we know? What, are the, what is the data? What is the statistics? And, and what do we know about people and... and uh, uh, unconscious, uh, uh, what's the German word for enjoying the suffering? Schadenfreude, Schadenfreude, right? Mm. Skip all that stuff and instead look at humor in yourself as you're enjoying it, as you're uh, watching it, or as you're observing it, or as you're feeling it. And the same thing with emotions. The words are not going to help you. Now, what the, the books will do is help you understand why it's important to look at things directly direct perception right direct observation that's where the action is it's not in in dissecting the words you know ad infinitum and so uh, yeah that's a good example of why we can't use words for some things now if you're an academic you know and you're going to study it for a thesis your phd or something that's different and and one doesn't preclude the other but in this uh, enterprise. We're interested in development of the of the human being and and her capacities. So, so for example, more on the lines of the direct perception or experiencing humor as opposed to diving into the word. Although I did a little bit of both. I was reading a Sufi teaching tale from Idris Shah and his commanding self, and then. It was a rather short one and I got to the end and it was like the conventional punchline and I started laughing because it was funny. And then I sat there and I was like, I thought about how it was a joyous feeling and the actual feeling of it. But then I was like, why did I laugh? 
and I couldn't come up with a, a great explanation for why I would why I had laughed. Well, yeah, so good, good. That's that's right. So that now this is the genius of the of the Sufi uh, uh, Nasruddin corpus. Is first there's the, the the enjoyment of the joke, and it also makes it easier to remember. So think how how generous that is to to go through the trouble of making a teaching f- fun, even joyful to read, and also more memorable. And then invariably behind it is a teaching about your own mind. And most people can't see that at first, so they they imagine somebody else is fine. You know, I'm not the mullah, somebody else is the mullah. <laughs> and, then, and then he realized, oh my God, <laughs> I am the mullah. I mean, for some of them, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's hilarious. It's, it's wonderful. And so, yeah, so that's exactly right. And now you're going to have to contemplate it. And sometimes it takes months. Sometimes it takes years depending on your particular, uh, you know, the defensive mechanism. Now, psychoanalysts, they'll spend, you know, five years with you and charge you, I mean, tons of money to give you that same insight, right? Mm-hmm. And here you can you get it for uh, next to nothing from the moolah. But, but it does take practice and it does take, <laughs> it does, it does take exposure to them, you know? Oh, the Bula. <laughs> what a guy. Uh, so then I, then I'm curious, there's so many things to contemplate. Yeah, uh, there sure where is. Is, <laughs> Where do you even get the time in the day for, uh, like, each of the teaching tales that I read? plus the Tao Te Ching, or another book if I'm reading it, and the Mula tales that are sticking in my mind, and the, and the conventional day-to-day things. Like well, the other day, we were talking about what is a corporation. Like what is a corporation, actually, not just throwing the word around, or a, a contemplating other things. What is money, or what is like the value of money, or different... There's just so much. And some things you want to stay with for like a full day or five days or whatever. Um, I guess the question is, what do you do when there's so much to possibly contemplate? The first thing you do is get your priorities straight. Now, if you don't have a roof over your head and you don't have food to eat, you're not going to be able to enjoy reading some of these texts or, or, or be able to benefit from them much. So first you got to take care of, of basic human needs, right? Mm-hmm. Then you have to want this more than you want anything else. I mean, you actually want it more than having to go to work, frankly, but you have to go to work. So, but, so this has to be the highest priority in your life. I mean, that, that would be my, my experience personally and my experience with, with other folks. It's got to be the highest priority. And, and secondly, uh, you start to, when you, when you take this seriously and you start to practice it, you realize you can practice it all day. You can practice it when you're going to the grocery store. You can practice it when you're driving your car. You can practice while you're, while you're, you know, in an argument with somebody about, you know, something that you're debating, you know, between friends or whatever. So, so, so th- this is not, uh, this is covered in the Avatamsaka Sutra, that everything is, is what they call religious practice. If you make it into that. Now, if you go down some rabbit hole or video game or some, you know, scrolling on TikTok or whatever, you're going to lose it. I mean, I can guarantee that will happen. I mean, it would take an absolute master of the highest order to be able to to do that and not, you know, go nuts. But it's driving people nuts. And and uh, I wonder sometimes if that's not the plan to just get people, uh, you know, either hooked on drugs or uh, uh, addicted to to their 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 screens such that they don't care what's going on outside. And, and so I'm not, I'm not a conspiracy theorist and I don't, 
I shouldn't have said plan, but I'm saying that's what's happening. We, we've, we've turned ourselves over to the machines, to the A-B testing of the AIs, and you, people need to get ready because these AIs, they're just getting started. They will be able to manipulate you in ways that you can't even imagine. I'm speaking now as a psychiatrist. They will manipulate you in ways you cannot even dream of. And if you're not prepared beforehand, you could easily be uh, a, a, a walking, I don't know what to call it. What do you call an unconscious sheep? A sheep that doesn't have consciousness. You're just there and you're, you're, you're just a zombie. You know, in, philosophy they call, like, uh, in philosophy, they call them zombies. You know, or automaton or something like that. that hap- that's happening. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of a lot of people out there that are deeply unconscious, and they suffer. They suffer horribly, and then they look for an escape. You know, like, you know, uh, party in Austin. Everybody's coked out. What are they doing coked out in the in 2023? You know, or ketamine, for example, a dissociative. You know, I, yeah, the drugs come and go, so on and so forth. It's, it's not to moralize. It's just to say, hey, these are symptoms of a deeper problem. Mm-hmm. Okay? And the deeper problem is a lack of meaning. And the lack of meaning comes from lack of purpose. And if you're going to have a purpose, my recommendation would be this one, self-development. Uh, because I think nothing comes close to it. But there's other purposes too, right? So, you know, it's not for everybody, but... But you've got to have meaning and you've got to have purpose or you're going to, you know, you know, be one of the skulls on the, on the side of the road, right? I have one question about how you just said that you recommend self-development in this sense, what we're talking about, um, as, a, as a major goal or source of meaning. What do you say, and you've touched on this slightly, but it was in an hour-long format, one-on-one conversation, so it's buried in there. What do you say to people who are concerned about being, quote, selfish uh, by focusing primarily on self-development? I don't know anybody like that. I've never encountered anybody like that. I mean, people worry about it, but it's, it's just a neurotic worry. Actually, it's just an ego defense. They're just trying to find some reason not to have, not to do the, the, you know, apply themselves or to do the, the work. You know, I hate to even say the word work or effort. Yeah. The ego will come up with a thousand different reasons why you can't do it. Right. Uh, you know, if I do it, everybody will, the kids in Africa will starve, you know, or something like that. It's just, it's just the ego defending itself because the ego doesn't want this to happen. It does not want this to happen. The ego is your master. The ego is your your actually cruel master, uh, and it's all wonky too. So, so it does not want to give up its dominion. And the name of this game is dominion over your ego. So it's a it's a real. I mean, as a, as the, the Muslims and the, and the Sufis put it, it's a real jihad. You know, the real jihad, the greater jihad, which is uh, uh, submission to God. I think that's it, or is it, yeah, submission to God? Mm-hmm. Or is it mastery of the self? It's the same thing, right? Right. And then the lesser jihad is is uh, war. Yeah, no, yeah, it's a war against the self. War over the self would be the greater jihad, and the lesser jihad would be, uh, you know, war against enemies or whatever. Right. Okay. So, yeah, you got a constant, that's another reason why you need a, uh, a guide or a teacher or a coach or something like that because your ego is going to play it. the most incredible tricks you could believe you wouldn't believe some of the tricks the ego comes up with you know, i was a psychiatrist all my life and <laughs> some of the things people come up with to keep from facing themselves it's 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 amazing also but of course the most common one is to blame somebody else right right and, and you see that all the time with people who are insecure or feeling inadequate they the way they deal with that is by blaming somebody else you know they call them a racist or call them a you know of whatever they call them blame blame somebody else you know whatever mm-hmm. and, yeah. and so that's about one of the most that's called uh, projection 
of uh, but of unconscious material. So you can't you can't confront them on this. They they won't have nothing of it. So 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 uh, these are just ego mechanisms of defense, which is something that probably should be incorporated into the the dharma, and maybe that's something I should think about because the, 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 there's you know there's although the the Sufis are way 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 far advanced relative to western psychology they're just there's no comparison the western psychologists do have something to contribute and then that would be the the findings and psychoanalysis of of the ego the mechanism of defense i think that would be helpful because i i personally uh many times i've run into the I'm being selfish one, like I should be going and doing something out in the world that helps people and have not recognized it in the past as an ego defense. I've, it's always been like, oh, that's a good, that's actually, why am I being this way? It's been a, it's been a powerful rationalization. Until you know what you're doing, it's a mistake. You know, and so I, I'm, I'm very, so I've been very subjected to that particular defense and acted out on it. And and I'm not saying that I regret it, but I am saying that I could have. The best thing you can do for this world is to elevate your consciousness. By it. there's no question, nothing even comes close. Because remember, there is a noosphere, there is a collective unconscious, there is a, a uh, 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 let's use the word mental for other, for lack of a better word, uh, envelope to this planet, right? And to to uh, town or a city or a house or whatever you can feel it when you're more sensitive you can feel the energy in the house and you can see how someone can walk in and change it right and i don't want to use the word energy that's wrong too but but so so what i'm trying to say is that when you elevate your consciousness you're helping everybody around you and not just since it's we're in a non-local universe right locality is gone man locality's out the window so so there are ways in which this helps everybody and that's the best thing a person can do for themselves and everybody else because frankly they are everybody else as everybody else is them and in the mind the way that's reflected is through the the impact of the ambient societal culture on the mentation of the person people are preoccupied with what the culture tells them to be preoccupied with Mm. You know, I, either either overtly or covertly, and if you're not aware of this, then you're you're not even the master of your own mind, right? Or your emotions, and and we see this acted out all over the place. So yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't worry. If, <laughs> yeah, that's just an ego defense. Uh, and the, what these last things you've been saying relate to what you said before that it would be a good contemplation, the, this collective unconscious thing. Do you have anything else to say about that? What are people contemplating there? No, I, I wouldn't recommend that as a contemplation per se. Oh, okay. It's as you become more sensitive, you'll be aware that some of your thoughts don't come from you. As a matter of fact, a lot of them don't come from you. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and then you start to recognize, you become more sensitive. These require capacities, right? Hidden capacities until they're uncovered. Right. And then you start to be able to, to sense them and to recognize them. And so, you know, it, it's like asking an ape to, like, uh, appreciate a, a, a Rothko, you know, uh, or, or even a, the Mona Lisa. The apes going to have to develop some new capacities, right? Yeah. And we are apes, and we need to develop better, uh, more of our latent capacities. Or we're, for one thing, we suffer unnecessarily all the time, and secondly, we go around and we hurt each other all the time. And what you'll learn, of course, at the end, of course, or not even at the end, that that what Jesus said is absolutely it's not, it's not metaphorical. Uh, treat your neighbor as yourself right or what you do unto the least of these you do unto me he he underst- he knows that he knows that you are the other and the other and that's just the way things are you know you can't get around that but that's a you know that's a fairly high level to to understand it fully you know it requires 
more capacity than most people generally have. They can think about it theoretically, but until you've experienced it, you 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 don't know it with a capital K. Uh, my next question is from Idris Shah's commanding self. Idris Shah is answering a question about service. And in this answer at the end, he says, how is real service learned? Not from people who merely propagate mechanical or emotional service, which are in fact servitude. And then he moves on to say, it is learned only from such people as can see why, where, and what service of an individual and a group does, can, and should mean in any given situation, such situations being seen as a part of the whole of the human evolutionary situation. The question is, how can one learn service from someone who knows what real service is? Ask him. For one thing, I remember once <laughs> I wanted to start an orphanage, not an orphanage, uh, a school for boys, right? Because there were so many kids in juvenile hall. And uh, a lot of them are orphans, frankly, or effectively orphans. And, and my teacher basically said uh, this is something about me that I won't repeat, but that, <laughs> that, I, that I shouldn't do that because I wasn't evolved enough, right? And I wasn't. So, so you know, I told him my plans and he said, I don't think that's a very good idea, David. <laughs> I'm eternally grateful to him for that because there were other things I needed to do, right? And, and I wasn't, you see, people go off half cocked and they, and they make mistakes and, and, they, and it appears good and they get, all the, uh, they get the applause of others, you know, and everybody looks up to them or whatever. They put their name on top of the hospital, whatever it is, you know, or they put their name on the, on the little scroll bar or whatever and and uh but that's not doing good that's the appearance of good doing good is very difficult but it, it's also very there's lots of opportunities for it but sometimes it doesn't look like you're doing good it may look like you're you're hurting someone when you chastise them in a certain way because they need to be chastised in that way or they can't hear it right and so, you know, there are times when, when uh, well, the Sufi stories are full of this, right? Where, where yeah. so, so uh, appearances, the appearances of this world are not this world. They are not reality. There's another reality that is reality, and it's totally different than this. In that it's, well, I shouldn't say it's totally different than this, because it, this can be so beautiful. I mean, it's so gorgeous. And then you see love everywhere when you look, like, look at the animals, right? Look at the trees. And so, so it, but people imagine that they know what good is, but they don't. That's the best I can do right now. But yeah, I'd ask them. In Idris Shah's The Commanding Self, he has a couple passages which... Uh, to my untrained eye, felt like they came out of nowhere on almost. And he talks about symbols, especially the Enneagon, which is otherwise known as a nonagon. And the Enneagram. The Enneagram. Right, right. And uh, the different representations it can show up in um, and its importance, but he can't go too deeply into it because... This is a question and answer format, and it would take a lot more. Uh, to yes, go it would. It take a lot more, including mathematics and including the, uh, you know, the use of, of the, the the rationale for certain numbers being considered uh, mystical. Uh, well, I can just briefly, if you look at the octave, it's made of seven notes, and then the octave that's eight, right? Well, those harmonics, and also there's divisions, I think, between the third and the fifth, right, in, in music. Now, why aren't the no notes equally spaced? Well, they're not equally spaced because that's not harmonious, it's not harmonic. And just like we see many, many mathematical uh, 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 
properties of, of plants, you know, the golden, the golden ratio, the golden section, you know, the, the basis of these beautiful flowers and all this other stuff. Uh, well, analogously, we see that, that this, this eight, this division of eight with spaces between, I think it's the third and the fifth. I don't know. I'm not an expert on it. But, but why is that? Why would we find that musically harmonious? And we aren't the only ones, by the way. And so then you look deeper at that and you see that there's, there's, there's uh, a, a relationship and there's a hole and there's a period. There's a, it goes, yeah, he's right. You go on and on and on forever. But, and so, uh, for example, the octagon and the, the uh, pentagram are related to each other in a very sophisticated way and these things have you know these were studied at a time before you know we threw all of this stuff out with the enlightenment the other problem of course is that it's been grossly popularized and uh but if you want the good root sources in in contemporary english it would be uh ochoa uh, a, a brilliant kind of uh i think he's chilean is one person and the other one is uh navarro is it or uh something like that anyway there there are books on this but but you know it's duck soup the further people get away uh, it's like the tarot also right it's not it's the roots of it are not understood right just like the names of the constellation we don't understand where those come from but the it's the evidence i mean the the data is right there right but we have to overcome our prejudice against uh, Muslims and Islam in order to get to, get to that, or they, they're gracious enough and, and generous enough to share it with us by translating it. And a lot of this hasn't been translated, but enough of it has. And then you, you also, some of it goes way back before Islam, way before Christianity. We go to, to Egypt and the, and the uh, hermeneutics, right? Or we go to you know the, the pre-Socratics. And also India. So, so this is a yeah. I can see why he said no, you don't want to get started on that one. That one could take you a long time. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah. But again, that's not the highest priority right now for for most people. As it's, it's kind of a byway uh -huh. at the moment. Now later, later you may find it interesting. Mathematicians do. I just ordered a book because it was recommended by somebody that I respect on uh, what's called sacred geometry. geometry, And I, I looked at a preview of it and it didn't look like the new age books. I mean, it didn't have, you know, elves and fairies and rainbows all over the place. It looked like a, more like a mathematician's book. And so uh, I have high hopes for it. I don't know. But see, a lot of these things are destroyed by, by cultural uh, uh, first neglect and then abuse. And so, so uh, that's a problem, but there's hope. All right, there's hope. Christianity, man, they, when they kicked the Muslims out of Spain, after Spain had run it for 700, 800 years, they tried to, I mean, the, the church pretty much tried to stamp out all of that stuff, but they did the same thing to Christian mysticism, right? They did the same thing to a lot of Neopl uh, Neoplatonics even though they, they owe a huge debt to, to Plato and Plotinus and people like that. So, so, you know, there was an active, you know, program of destroying these uh, heritages and then pretend it comes from you, right? The Kabbalah, for example, the Kabbalah, what is it, the Jewish one, the Kabbalah? I think it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's 10th century. I didn't know that. I thought that thing was much older than that. But it's, oh, it's 10th century. So it has roots too. And, and so, so all of these things are, are open for, for study. But this is not the study of self-development. This is more the study of the history of, of uh, I don't know what, the, there's not a name for it, which is fine. There shouldn't be a name for it. And the names that have been applied to it are basically pejoratives. And so we'll leave it unnamed. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, sacred ge geometry, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> sacred geometry. But so, so, but it does mean something. And, and the roots are sacred. And the, and the roots are, are deep, deep, deep. 
Uh, so, but it, it's become a pejorative. Have you noticed that if you say the word God or if you say the word uh, Jesus or Christian or, or mystical or mystic, those things are like basically insults in academia. As this, Those are pejoratives. Well, as in Islamic academia as well? I don't know enough about current Islamic uh, academia, but I doubt it since since they translated the Latin uh, texts and the yeah. you know and the Egyptian texts or what, it, what there was of them and a lot of the the uh, the Socratics and the pre Socratics. So I don't think they're going to like take themselves out of the picture. They may do the opposite and try and get rid of uh, the Christian contribution. As a matter of fact, that's more likely than not. But I'm not saying it's going to happen, but that's kind of cultural human nature or human cultural nature. But maybe we can overcome that now that we have the uh, internet and we have, you know, instant communication and we have well, uh, the dissemination of all the world's knowledge at your fingertips. You know, it's extraordinary time, extraordinary time of of possibility for us. And we just have to keep from wiping ourselves out. <laughs> Easier said than done. Eh, we'll see. We'll see. Something will survive. There's, uh, uh, you know, what covers a lot of this, but it, it's a it's a long read and it's difficult. Is uh, a beautiful book called, which I did not expect, called uh, uh, "A Canticle for Leibowitz," a science fiction book, and not a very popular one, and not very well known except among some people. And this thing is like one of the greatest treatises on, on the early church. Uh, and the whole uh, construct of religion, because religion goes wonky, uh, predictably, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's not, that's the answer is not just religion, right? Or religion, religion has a very important function. And, and without it, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have uh, the Socratic texts, for God's sake, right? And the and the the monks, you know, in Ireland and the ones in France and everybody else, they did a huge service to humankind by preserving these things before the printing press, right? And so, the world is very complex. And this is where you're doing good and and not doing, you know. I'm sure all these guys thought they were doing good by burning these books because they weren't, you know, they weren't in in from the Christian, uh, they were full of non-Christian doctrine and they were full of uh, Gnostic uh, heresies. Right. And so that's where, you know, people go, again, go off half, half cocked and, and they think they're doing good. They think they, they, go, they go to rescue a, a tribe in, in the South Pacific and they give them all smallpox, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to laugh, but that's what happens all the time. Right? They think they're making vaccines and bioweapons at the same time. And they ends up, they never really, I mean, I'm sorry, I shouldn't go into that. But, it, but you know, you, you, a lot of mistakes get made by well meaning people. Well, let me just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. All right. I have, we could do one more. We could do one more. Yeah, I have one more. And it actually right. relates. So how then can one learn the ultimate consequences of one's actions? It seems way too complex to be able to understand the implications of one of your actions. There's, there's an assumption in your question, which is forgivable, but should be pointed out. Okay. And, and that is that one can... No, and then understand the ultimate consequences of an action. And I think that needs to be looked at as a first step in answering that. Can it be answered? So I've looked at, the, this is one of the ones that I've been looking at for like uh, multiple years. And I, I haven't convincingly... Uh, 
come to a conclusion that I could know the ultimate consequences of one of my actions to be good or bad to like there are some things that I do that feel or what I can see their results being a lot more conducive to everybody's health and happiness than other things which I have done which seem pretty convincingly uh not conducive to everybody's health and happiness but the second third fourth order consequences of those things i'm one frequently proved wrong about my initial judgment and two they get so far out and so there's so many i guess butterfly effect is the word that i just can't it's hard for me to say that i that i know where one of my actions leads what Rumi, what this reminds me of is something that Rumi said famously. There's a field beyond good and bad. Meet me there. Do you see that? And so in order to meet me there, though, you, you have to elevate consciousness because you can't, you wouldn't be able to understand the answer, right? You can't, you can't understand the answer to some questions until you passed a certain, uh, frankly cognitive errors mm -hmm. and so so and that's not to be nihilist it's not nihilistic at all Rumi was not a nihilist but i think he said it as better than anyone else there's a field beyond good and bad meet me there so, so just to think about that let it let it percolate let it let it sit there let it do whatever it's going to do but remember it if you can and also uh the Tao Te Ching is is very good about this okay and also Jesus you know judge not lest you you be judged that's you know one way of framing one facet of it or or uh Muhammad my back has been broken by pious men So one of the ways that this work works is that these little pieces start to fall together. And then all of a sudden, it's one day you go, oh, aha, aha, you know, it, it all make, it makes sense. And it does make sense. It makes perfect sense. It makes better sense than anything else. <laughs> and, so, and so, but it takes time, it takes patience, and it takes work. It takes effort and preparation. At first, it's effort. And then it's just joy, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no effort in, in what I'm doing because there's not, you know, what can I say? And that's been true for a while. So, so people, they, but you do have to make the initial investments like everything else in this world, except for the, the beauty of, 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 of nature, you know, like, like, you know, or your mother's love, you know, so something, those things are free. Not to the mother, <laughs> not to the mother, but to the child. And so, 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 yeah, most everything else in this world requires uh, effort. And if you're going to do well, you need to be sincere. And if you're really going to do really well, then you need to set your intent and know where you want to get. And that could be any number of places. Right. Some are wiser than others. What did Elon tweet out in the Hebrew? <laughs> he tweeted something out in the Hebrew that uh, in translation it said uh, wisdom and then he uses more than, more than sign twice. Mm -hmm. Wisdom, uh, more than, more than uh, money. I think it was in an interchange with an Israeli. Right. I thought it was kind of cool because it's true. Well, I, and Elon understands that, I, th and I think, I hope. Yeah. All of us should. But that doesn't mean you don't need money. I mean, you're not helping anybody by depending on them for your support, for your, your bread and, and, and roof. Definitely. So, okay. That's okay. about what I could do on that. Okay. All right, good. Good. <laughs>